let's say that we have five oranges. And let's say that there's five people. Each person gets an orange and for a fair price. Everyone's happy. Now let's change things up just a little bit. Let's say that we now have five oranges, but 10 people. Suddenly there's not enough oranges for all the people. To control the excess demand, the oranges go up in price and people start missing out on oranges. What's the best solution here? Should we simply ask the farmer to grow more oranges or should we say no to five of these people? Too bad you don't get an orange. Australia's housing crisis has become one of the worst in the world, with owning your own home becoming an out of reach dream for young Australians such as myself. Across Australia, the portion of median income required to service a new loan is a shocking 44.7%, with the average dwelling costing 7.3 times the average income. It now takes a staggering 9.7 years for Australians to save up for the average 20% deposit on a home. It seems tragically clear now that the average Australian is never going to own a home, not unless they're on a high income or have help from the bank of mum and dad. What's the solution to all of this? Cut immigration. At least, that's what many people will tell you. The net overseas migration in the year to June 2023 reached a record-breaking 518,090 people, the highest in Australia's history. Now, surely that's contributing to the housing crisis. It's simple economics, isn't it? If you have too many people trying to buy those oranges, there won't be enough oranges for everyone, and its price will go up astronomically. Before even watching this video, many of you will have already made up your mind on immigration, on its detriments, and I have to accept that. But I know that not all of you will. Many of you will want to genuinely hear how I justify why Australia needs immigration, because this is a complicated issue, and the decisions that we make now could very well change the course of Australia for decades to come. Before I continue, massive shout out to my monthly Kofi supporters. Please do consider supporting me over on Kofi if you can. Also, if you're interested in housing, the ways in which it affects our lives, and how we can solve the housing crisis, I'd strongly urge you to check out my series, The Housing Struggle, link in the top right. Australia is an immigrant country. Ever since the First Fleet, we've been accepting immigrants to this country. Indeed, unless you were Aboriginal, at some point in your ancestry, your family were migrants to Australia too. Whether that was 10 years ago or 200 years ago, the simple fact is that Australia has been built on immigration, with 7.5 million people having migrated to Australia since 1945. Almost 30% of Australians today are first generation migrants. I think Australia as a whole benefits from immigration and the migrants themselves benefit. A lot of the nurses are migrants. So many of the service providers are migrants, your hairdresser. Also the skilled migration. I mean, um, migrants are contributing at every level. I'm a migrant myself. I'm a university professor. And there are lawyers who are migrants. There are doctors who are migrants. So um, let's get it out of our mind that Australia is taking in migrants out of charity or just to benefit rich people. They'll, they'll work in sectors that um, incumbent populations might not want to, um, and then incumbent populations will be earning, earning more and um, and having a, literally a better job because they don't have to do those jobs because those jobs are being filled. If you re really care about these people in your electorate, why do you want to keep them in that type of work when you can get them higher paying jobs that they're competitive for? Work conducted by the Business Council has shown that for every 1,000 migrants, there is a $124 million economic dividend each year to Australia, $38 million more in tax revenue, and $59 million in increased investment. Migrants help to balance out our aging population. 
filling in critical skill shortages and drive our skills base through their relatively high levels of education. If I go to cafes in my neighborhood and they say, due to so shortage of labor, the queues will be longer, bear with us. So who's going to do the jobs? if we stop migration. I do think that a majority of people wouldn't deny that immigration is good for Australia. Things change, however, when you start factoring in the housing crisis. 2023 saw record-breaking immigration, and surely that would have an impact on the housing crisis, right? We're flooding Australia with new migrants, creating a big Australia, and our infrastructure simply cannot keep up. Okay, yes, there's no point denying that immigration does have an impact on the housing crisis. Demand goes up, prices go up. But accusations of a big Australia aren't exactly true. Australia currently is experiencing higher than normal uh, migration flows, but a lot of it is what we call recuperation migration. Uh, we had very few migrants move in um, during the pandemic, so now we're recuperating. It is somewhat higher and migration might stay a bit higher for the next year or two, uh, but then it will stabilize. If you average out the net overseas migration over the past three years, you end up with a number lower than the decade preceding the pandemic. We lost 500,000 net migrants from June 2019 to June 2022, and those coming back are simply rebalancing things. Furthermore, fewer migrants are leaving Australia than usual, expected to return to normal in future years. Indeed, Australia's population is still expected to be over 375,000 people below the forecast prior to the COVID pandemic. I've simply had enough with this obsession that Australia is being flooded with migrants. The stats just don't lie. Okay, so maybe we're not being flooded with migrants per se, but we do have too many people and too few homes. That's what's causing the housing crisis. Would it not just make sense to cut immigration, you know, just for a few years while we catch up on our infrastructure, build more homes and just get things back on track in general? Less people, more oranges, lower prices. Simple. Well then, riddle me this. Why was the housing crisis not resolved when we literally shut our borders for two years during COVID? House prices continued to go up, as did rents. Presumably, it was because immigration does not have quite the significant impact that people believe it does. That is to say, even if we had net emigration, which is literally what happened in 2020, we still don't have enough homes for everyone. Furthermore, if you are asking why we don't just pause immigration for a few years, then you've already forgotten everything I said about three minutes ago. We don't accept migrants into Australia out of the goodness of our hearts. We do it because we need them. Like you have these sectors that are structurally constantly looking for workers, like meatpacking, agriculture, things like this, that just can't find um, Australians. And some will say you just need to pay them more, but it's really not that simple. When there's other people who are willing to have welfare gains of between three and 10 times their pre-departure earnings to come and work on that, you'd have a hard time convincing me that that's not actually a pre optimal like a welfare improving outcome for everyone. We get cheaper goods in, in the supermarket because um, it's the consumption side as well. Business leaders have been declaring over the past year that 160,000 skilled workers are needed per year in order to resolve labour shortages in fields such as engineering, construction, medicine, aged care and especially technology. Furthermore, it was recently found that an extra 90,000 tradespeople are needed over the next three months alone if we have any hope of building 1.2 million homes across Australia by 2029 and the hundreds of infrastructure projects to supplement that. Stopping migration will not magically evaporate the need for more homes and infrastructure. Sure, we might need less of it, but we'll still need it and they can't catch up if not for skilled migrant labour. If anything, our migrant program isn't focused enough on tradespeople. We need to bring in more trade labour than we currently are. It's not as though we're bringing in five people who will eat oranges and do nothing else. In fact, it's actually more accurate to say that at least two of these people are orange farmers who will help to grow more oranges. To be clear, these other three are also doing their own important things. It's a win-win. This is what we call the lump of labour fallacy. It's the false idea that migrants will boost supply or boost demand without recognition of the fact that they will invariably boost both. 
when people do move into your town or into your country, they are obviously earning and buying things as well and propping up local demand. Migrants contribute to both the amount of work performed and they create the need for more work to be done. Indeed, the bigger the population, the better, due to economics of scale. A bigger population allows companies to spread out their fixed costs over a larger customer base, lowering costs. Okay, well, fair enough. We're accepting migrants into Australia because we aren't building houses fast enough. But wait a second, why can't we just train some of these five Australians to grow some more oranges instead of bringing in other people to do it? That way we get more oranges, but the same amount of people. Well, this one's actually pretty easy to rebut. We currently have one of the lowest unemployment rates in our history. Most of these five people are currently busy doing other important things. So unless we bring these people in, there's kind of no one to grow these oranges. Furthermore, Australia has an aging population. In 1975, there were 7.3 workers supporting each pensioner. Today, that's only four workers. By 2060, it's expected to be only 2.7. This isn't entirely bad. A shrinking population in particular would help to reduce Australia's environmental footprint. But we can't just allow our population to shrink negligently either. Productivity will fall. The tax base will shrink, meaning less money left for the government to spend. Meanwhile, health costs and pension benefits will only go up in price. You have an increasingly small group of workers forced to sustain an increasingly large group of retirees. Baby bonuses are great and all, but I already know I don't want more than two kids. And I know many people who don't want any kids, irregardless of all the money the government may want to offer. The only way to balance out our aging population is migration. I hope that I've made it clear why exactly we need these five people. That is why Australia needs migration. But we're in a housing crisis. If we don't reduce the number of people, what do we do instead? Simple. We increase the number of oranges. Okay, before that, big news. Amy and I are about to move out of home and start renting. About to become a victim of the rental crisis. Yippee. Rent isn't cheap as you all know, that's the whole point of this video. And so I need your help more than ever. I have relied a lot on my Kofi supporters over the past two years to support me financially, which has allowed me to cut down on my tutoring hours and focus much more on YouTube. I reward my Kofi supporters too, with things like early access content and invitations to my film shoots. Some supporters even helped me film my 15 minute cities video. Even the smallest amount of money from you, whether it be a one-off donation or one of my five memberships, will keep me from needing to find a job now that I'm moving out and instead continue to make quality content for you. Anyways, thank you for listening, back to the show. But where should these oranges go? Where should we be putting more oranges? Now, you see this whole time, I've put the oranges pretty close to each other, but in reality, this would probably be more accurate. The density of Greater Sydney is only around 2,194 people per square kilometre, far lower than very livable cities such as London, Paris and New York. Density in Sydney steeply drops off as you get further and further from Sydney CBD, far faster than other large cities. Look at Haberfield, look at Balmain, look at Dulwich Hill, all located on the doorstep of Sydney CBD. I cannot even briefly entertain the notion that Sydney is full. Imagine that we built, say, some six-storey apartments here, if not taller. Suddenly, we'd have a lot more supply. Except we can't do that. Most of these three suburbs, and indeed much of inner Sydney, is zoned only for R2 single-family detached homes. RBA research has shown that such restrictive zoning contributes a whopping 40% to the price of houses in Sydney and Melbourne. So instead of building apartments in suburbs like these, we're building more detached suburbia on the outskirts of our cities, simply because inner cities are not zoned for anything dense enough to accommodate for our growing population. Imagine that we already had all of these oranges and extra space here, but then we told people, nope, you can go eat those oranges all the way out there. There's no room for any more oranges here. Auckland is a brilliant example of a city that declared that there is room for more oranges. Auckland rezoned approximately three quarters of its residential land area by abolishing single family zoning, massively boosting its housing supply. 
Consequently, a June 2023 paper found that rents in Auckland are between 14 to 35 percent lower than they otherwise would have been without the reforms. And so it's no surprise that New South Wales Premier Chris Minns is fighting hard to rezone Sydney. He's announced mass up zonings at 39 stations across Greater Sydney, expected to accommodate 185,800 additional dwellings over the next 15 years. A majority of Sydney siders are on board with this plan. 43% support it, 31% are undecided, and only 26% oppose it. Yet if you spoke to certain privileged NIMBYs, you'd think that Chris Min's plan was the end of the world. From Mordale to Balmain to Fairfield to Kuringai, communities all over Sydney have been protesting loudly over the past year to maintain the character of their neighbourhoods. Frankly, it's little wonder that more housing struggles to get built in Sydney. A lot of people are benefiting from the housing crisis and from the broken housing system that we have now. Our neighbourhoods being very, very regressive, a lot of uh, people who are currently homeowners being extremely selfish, dare I say immoral, that's, that's an immoral position at this point to um, be a NIMBY when um, there are homeless people on the street. Those older people, the baby boom generation, they're not sacrificing anything. I mean, they still have their single family homes. Their homes have gone up in value quite a lot. The only thing they might be sacrificing is a little bit more traffic in their neighborhoods. And I say it's okay for some people to put up with a little bit more traffic if it means that um, a whole set of other people will have a roof over their heads. There's also the nativist element as well, right? Um, yeah. Um, the sort of nationalist, nativist. like we just gotta protect Australians. It's about Australians. We shouldn't be worrying about anyone. It's kind of yeah. yeah. Um, it's not how the, how the country, Australia has become great. It's not how we've grown. It's not really a part of our political and multicultural. And this just seems like shooting yourself in the foot on a lot of other things that are very important to us. When we've got a whole bunch of other policy levers that. Would not be as would not be detrimental when you consider all the good that australia gets from immigration economic benefits cultural benefits the simple ability to allow more people to call this great country home it's kind of hard to fathom that many would rather we just close our borders than implement the straightforward changes that a majority of voters support i was born in australia and i've spent my whole life here but i'm the son of migrants most of my friends are the children of migrants Unless you were Aboriginal, at some point in your ancestry, your family migrated to Australia. What if Australia had said no to my mum in 1986 when she moved to study in Melbourne? What if Australia had said no to my dad in 1973 when his dad got a job as a teacher in southwestern Sydney? I wouldn't be here making videos about transport and urban planning for you. What if Australia had said no to your ancestors when they moved here? There is nothing fundamentally different about Australia in 2024 that makes us more full than we were last century, other than a stubborn and selfish refusal to shed our clinical obsession with detached houses. Not only must we rid ourselves of this intense love affair, but we must also have some compassion. Maybe some of us will need to live in density, but if that allows hundreds more to call this great nation home, then I say, so be it. There are far more benefits and less repercussions to increasing supply than there are to cutting immigration. I'm resigned to the fact that many of you will continue to believe in the merit of cutting immigration. Go ahead, argue away in the comments. I know that immigration will likely emerge as a key election issue in the 2025 federal election, but I hope that fact prevails that people recognise that there is a way to have our cake and eat it too, that we can stabilise house prices while still allowing more people to call Australia home. I know the future that I want for my country. Do you? Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Oh, shut up. I'm hungry, okay? Delicious.